Welcome to a rubber tree plantation here in Asia. The first use of latex rubber was by the indigenous cultures of Mesoamerica. Earliest evidence of the use of latex rubber was by the Olmec culture. Mesoamerica was the historic regions of modern day Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Belize, and Guatemala. Groups within these areas were comprised of the Olmec, Zapotec, Maya, Taltec, and the Aztec peoples. The world leaders in latex production are Thailand, China, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. So what we're looking at here is the actual rubber tree. And if you'll notice, the incision that's been made on the side of the tree in a downhill fashion goes into a little small spout and what happens is the tree actually bleeds the latex rubber. And after it drips down very, very slowly into these buckets. If you notice on this particular rubber tree, it's been scarred many, many times over the years. And then there's still the downhill scar, which is actually bleeding the latex out of the tree. And once again, uh, bleeding it into a little small bucket, which will be collected later. So this is how rubber is actually collected and then it goes to a processing plant and becomes the tires that's actually on your vehicles. Synthetic rubber was first created by the Germans in 1905. By 1925, the demand for natural rubber could not be met. This brought about the need for a synthetic rubber. And still today, 99% of all natural latex rubber comes from the tree that is known as the crying wood.
Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the Mekong River here in uh, northern Thailand. I've spent almost a decade now uh, traveling quite a bit on my motorcycle, but uh, four main countries uh, that the Mekong River uh, travels through. This river has always attracted me for whatever reason it might be, but you know, it's a historic river. And one of the things that I've seen here recently uh, that's pretty dramatic, and you see it here, is the fact that there's massive reduction in water flowing through the Mekong. And the main reason for that is uh, the dams, the big dams in China, there's 11 of them for the production of electricity. There's uh, another one in Laos across the, the river there further up. And there's also one in Cambodia with the projection of upwards of another 20 dams. Well, you can see the effect that these dams have. But one of the big effects uh, is a massive reduction in water supply to this river brought about by China who controls the water tap, if you will. So what we're going to do with what I'm calling the river project is we're going to dive into some of the other issues as well as the dams that create this particular situation here. So with that, uh, I welcome you into this particular project. Follow along, formulate your own opinions, do your own research, and see what you come up with uh, towards the end of it. But it's pretty dramatic here on the Mekong now. So with that, uh, we'll dive into some of the issues, uh, and I hope you'll follow along, and I hope you'll enjoy it. I'd also like to give a shout out for the Life Cafe here for allowing me to film near this rock. Uh, wonderful people. But with that, we'll move on, and uh, we'll deal with some of the issues. Thanks for being here. Welcome back to uh, the River Project. As stated in the introduction, uh, we're going to deal with some of the issues that go along with what's happening to the Mekong River. And the first one uh, we already talked about a little bit, but that's the uh, water flow in the Mekong River. The dramatic uh, reduction of that water flow is obviously due to dams, many, many dams. And there are proposals for many more dams on the Mekong River. All right. So with that water flow uh, being reduced, it creates a lot of other issues. It creates issues with fisheries, creates issues with the uh, people that try to grow crops along the Mekong. And then another one is, um, what happens to the temperature of the water? As this uh, river slows down, there's more and more shallow areas uh, that the water is warming up. And what effect does that have on the fish? What effect does that have in particular on the quality of the water for the people that have to live from it. So that's one major issue, uh, is the actual flow of the river, the quality of the river as far as the amount of water coming through it. The next issue we'll deal with um, is going to be a big one that's worldwide. It's called sand mining. Okay, uh, another issue that I alluded to, uh, and it's a big one worldwide, and it's called sand mining. Now some people might ask, why in the world would you mine sand? Well, the answer to that is right here in the river, all right? In any of these major rivers, those sand molecules have been rolled down the river for centuries. And what happens to that molecule of sand is it fractures, gets multifaceted faces on the sand. And why it's desirable is because this makes much, much stronger concrete. So with all of the mega building that's going on all over the world, people want strong concrete, so they want this sand. So that's another major issue, not only on the Mekong, but worldwide. Sand mining, and the effects are dramatic.
Well, another uh, major issue here on the Mekong, and it's not just the Mekong, it's all over the world, and that is pollution. Looking out at the river right now, there's bags of trash floating down this river. And speaking with a young lad that actually grew up here, uh, even he said that the amount of pollution that's gone into the river since he was a child is immense. And you see it every day here. People will wrap up their trash in a plastic bag, tie it off, and throw it in the river. And then it's somebody else's problem. How do we address this? In the past, I think the best way, and maybe in the future as well, is the best way is to need to educate the children and let the children educate the adults as to the effects that pollution has not only on the river, but on the landscape as a whole. So that's another thing to think about is how do we go about educating people so that the pollution doesn't end up in this river, another insult, if you will, to what used to be a very majestic and historic river. Well, another issue uh, on this river is the dramatic reduction in water flow. I've come by, I guess, as I said before, riding over 400,000 kilometers in Southeast Asia to this point. I used to come along this river and actually be able to see larger boats coming up this river. The rocks, you couldn't see the rocks. Every once in a while, you know, you might have rocks popping out. This used to be a series of large rapids, but nonetheless, it was deep enough for these larger boats uh, to get up to Chang San and uh, further up the river. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, so that's another major effect of when you start drawing the water down to the extent that it is. So what does that have to do with transportation? Yes, uh, we can do everything by truck. Uh, it's a lot more expensive than what it used to be by the, you know, doing it by river. But nonetheless, uh, it still affects the people as a whole that live here. They used to be able to transport their goods downriver or upriver without any problems. Put it on a large barge or a large boat and send it on its way. So, in another way that it's affected the economy of the people that live along the Mekong River. I'd like to welcome you back to the river project and currently today we're sitting along the uh, Mekong River in a place called Chang Kong and I want to deal with a couple more issues that I haven't dealt with yet and one of them is fish migration so we're going to dive into that here uh, real shortly so stick with me I'll be right back with you okay um, back with you here the sun in my face nonetheless but uh, one of the areas that we haven't dealt with yet, it's called fish migration. And that is, in the Mekong River, there are several fish that migrate, all right? One of them is the Mekong giant catfish. And when that catfish is not allowed to migrate, it becomes extinct. And at this particular time, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 giant catfish in the entire 1,300 kilometer range of the Mekong River. Uh, and that is because it cannot climb dams or get by the dams. The same problem that we have in the United States with the salmon, with the dams. The only difference is the salmon are, for the most part, quite a bit smaller than the giant catfish. Nonetheless, the issues are the same. So with more and more dams, there's less and less fish being able to migrate to what they normally used to do. So with that, let's touch on another area here, and I'll be right back with you. Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, we have competition across the river in Laos. But continuing with the migration, the fish migration issue, the dams are not allowing the fish to migrate as they have for thousands and thousands of years. One really good example of a fishery that has been dramatically uh, affected by the fact that the flow in the Mekong has reduced as it has. And that is a lake in Cambodia called Tonlesap. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, inland lake, freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. 
And what used to happen once a year when the Mekong River would flood, it would actually reverse the flow of the river coming out of Tonosap back into the lake, bringing necessary nutrients for the fish as well as fish that usually migrate. That doesn't happen anymore, and it doesn't happen anymore because of the dams. And primarily, the person that controls the dams, once again, is China. So with that, let's uh, move into another issue associated with this. Continuing with the uh, fish migration issues, when you take into account uh, the length of the Mekong River that originally starts in the Himalayas in uh, northern China, it's almost 1,500 miles long. And when you think about that, the amount of people that rely on this river for that amount of distance is incredible. And they're dramatically affected by what's happening or what has been referred to as the collapse of the Mekong River ecosystem. And that is definitely happening. So I brought about the conclusion before this particular uh, fish immigration issue and I'm probably going to change the conclusion a little bit because I think in, in the first conclusion, which I will include, um, I think it was just a little, shall we say, uh, easy on the main contributor to this problem, that being China. Because China not only builds their own dams, as I had stated previously, they also build dams for across the river here, Laos, Cambodia, all the way down to the Mekong Delta which it has, been, it has been stated by scientists that by 2040, at the rate of the reduction of the Mekong River currently, by, there again, 2040, the Mekong Delta will no longer exist. And when you consider the historic value, not to mention the amount of people that live and rely on that Mekong Delta, it's absolutely incredible. So what are we gonna do? What's anybody going to do? You look at the, the uh, Asian uh, group of people uh, that are in charge, the main countries that, uh, except for China, that this river flows through, and they seem to be afraid to address China. China is the big guy. China is the one that's got the button on the water. And, and uh, so what do you do? Something has to happen or this river system is gonna to go to the point where it's completely collapsed, the ecosystem's gone, the fisheries are gone, and the people that rely on this river are gonna starve. And, and that has to do with fisheries as well as the way they grow their crops. It's all related to the amount of flow and water coming in the Mekong. Think about it. So if you will, uh, that concrete pillar on the right hand side of your screen, if you follow the brown going up the concrete, those are the areas where the river actually used to flow, in particular at the top during flood stage. So you can see how dramatic the reduction of water flow is here. Where you see the green brush and trees to the left of that, that actually used to be the original river bank itself. Well, looking at this river today, and knowing what it was like 10 years ago, really ask myself, you know, what's it gonna be in another 10 years? What's gonna happen to the people that live the 1,500 mile range or longer of the Mekong River? This river once was called the Mother of Waters because it provided life for everyone along the river from China on down. It brought about new generations of people. It fed those people and they were capable of moving on. But now, the mother of waters just seems to be dwindling away, and mainly because of the person that controls the water, the majority of the water on the mother of waters, and that's China. China has to be dealt with, because eventually it's gonna affect China and their people. So there you are. What are we as humans gonna do about it?
Today we are fortunate to be at Miss F's farm, family farm here in Northern Thailand. And she's been nice enough to be able to show me around a little bit as well as some of the things that her family does. So we're exploring the issue of how they make charcoal. We are also looking at how they finish rice and most of the rice that they're finishing it will end up being sticky rice which is for their consumption. Additionally, uh, her wonderful mother actually makes brooms, beautiful brooms. So, once again, uh, how long did you live at the farm here before you went to university? 20 years old. 20 years old. And then how long in university? Four years. Four years. Yeah. And then you studied what? Uh, Dara Devi Hotel. Ah, so tourism. Yeah. Tourism, okay. All right. So with that, what do you say you and I... We'll go take a look at some of this really neat stuff that her family does here. Okay? Okay. All right. Look forward to seeing you. Let's go. In the farm. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> here we're looking at sticky rice, the unfinished sticky rice at this point. Here, Mr. Jan is actually pouring the unfinished rice into their new machine. So what is taking place now is the rice now will be removed and put on a wicker screen. And then what she will do is she will sift this as has been done for thousands of years the same way. And what it does is separates the impurities from the rice. So she can, as you will see here, she'll be able to pick out the impurities and get rid of it. It's another way of purifying the rice. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is we're looking at rice kernels that are actually broken. And sometimes the machine breaks these. So they're unacceptable, so what happens with this is they become chicken feed. Miss Bella here, she seems to enjoy the fractured rice as well. So as one can see here, this is a very laborious process. But in turn, this is their food supply, so it's very important that it's done properly. So here we are fortunate enough uh, to see F's mother and she is making handmade brooms which are incredible brooms if you've ever had the chance to use one. So F, what is, uh, ask your mom how long has she has been making these brooms. Okay, she told me if uh, if the raw material is ready one day is finished. One day for how many brooms? Two. Two brooms. And where does she sell the brooms? She just makes for the house? Yeah. Ah, very good. <laughs> and then what is the, if you could ask her what the grass is that she actually uses <laughs> or where <laughs> this actually comes from. <laughs> ah, okay, so it comes from the coconut tree. Yeah, coconut tree. This one. <laughs> oh, okay. My father um, cut. Mm -hmm. cut. Yeah, and my mom bring to make the So this is uh, kind of a finished product, even though this one particular was bought. Your, your mother's brooms end up looking just like this, correct? Very, very nice. I've used these brooms and they're incredible. Uh, I wish we had them in the United States, but we don't.
Okay, so this is Miss F looking at the entrance of the, I'm calling it a kiln, but it's really not a kiln. Uh, F, what is this actually called again? Hintai Sautan. Sautan? Sautan. Sautan. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, well, maybe I finally got the name right. But anyhow, what we're looking at is a Sautan, and this is where they make charcoal. Okay, so today we're going to explore exactly how this particular kiln works to create charcoal. And this will be the actual entrance here for the main fire and when they actually start. And then we'll go inside of the and show you what the inside looks like and the actual stacking the wood itself. Okay, so once again, uh, we're looking at, uh, I'm calling it a kiln. It's really not a kiln, but I have problems pronouncing the original name. But this is the entrance, and uh, once the wood has been stacked in the inside and it's ready to start firing, then this door will be put in place and then sealed with clay, as well as any other cracks that might appear during the firing process. So this is the, actually uh, the leche wood itself, which is a hardwood. It's actually a fruit tree. Uh, and what we're looking at is the way it's stacked inside of... I forgot the name of the place again. I can't pronounce it very well, but that's okay. Um, so it's hard to see the fact that the ceiling is all black, but nonetheless, that's how it's supposed to be and how it ends up. But there again, back down to the way the wood, the wood right here is not stacked all the way to the ceiling yet, but it soon will be. But then, as I had stated before, um, this right here, is the main firebox or where the main fire comes out circulates up over the ceiling and creates the slow burn which creates the charcoal if it were a fast burn it would just burn the wood up and it's not uh, designed to be able to do that it's designed for a nice long slow burn thereby creating the charcoal that we saw a little bit earlier from this leche wood Okay, so now what we're looking at, this is one of the vent holes. And there's a number of these vent holes that will be pipes attached to it. And then uh, the heat and the smoke is allowed to come out of it. And there's uh, another one. Actually, there's a couple of them on the outside here, which I'll show you. Now we're looking at one of the main vents that comes out of the back side. And as I said before, this pipe goes up and it becomes one of the smokestacks, if you will. Uh, for the process here. This is the main one at the opposite of the firebox and now we'll look at one of the side okay, ones. So now we're looking at one of the side ones here. The same thing. There'll be another pipe which is actually uh, right here and if the dog will get out of the way. Okay and so anyhow that will get sealed up as well. <laughs> There's some more being held up by Yosef's mother. Yeah, so this is really a fantastic long process, but nonetheless. And then they sell this uh, firewood or this charcoal, if you will. They sell the charcoal to other people, and that helps to be able to finance the farm here. Okay, as you can see here, uh, the door has been sealed up, as well as some of the other areas. Uh, the fire is now going in the inside. As you can see the smoke and steam is starting to come out of some of the vent pipes. So what we're looking at now is the actual main firebox as fire is being introduced into the Tao Tan. And then as the heat increases they'll continue to build this fire 24-7 for at least the first two weeks. And then they will actually seal the unit up uh, with air being able to get into it and continue the slow burn process that creates the charcoal. I'd like to conclude uh, just by saying how welcoming these people were to be able to share their own talents and what they actually produce on their farm. Absolutely wonderful people and they're so friendly. Um, we have become friends through this process and I, I 
greatly appreciate their friendship and I greatly appreciate them allowing me to be able to film some of the stuff that they actually do in the process of keeping their farm running.